May the Lord be with us. Amen. Amen. Stephen Galloway's novel, The Cellist of Sarajevo, is set in the midst of a civil war that broke out in southern Europe in the 1990s between the Croats and the Serbs. It tells the story of a professional musician, a cello player, who is shocked by the brutality of the war. One day, one morning, outside a bakery in Sarajevo, 22 people had lined up hungry for bread when a shell landed and exploded, blowing them to bits. Outraged, the next morning, the cellist gets up, puts on his formal black tails, grabs his cello, makes his way to the bomb crater outside of the bakery, sits down in a charred chair, and defiantly plays beautiful music. In the midst of a war zone, out in the open, exposed to sniper fire, yet never shot. It's as if the beauty of his music was repelling the violence of the war. Every day for the next 22 days, the cellist makes his way to that bomb crater, sits down on the charred chair, and plays beautiful music one day for each of the 22 victims of the shell. To me, that is a very compelling image. It, it reminds me of the words of Psalm 27, 3. Though war rise up against me, even in this I will be confident. Have you ever known somebody like that? All hell can be breaking out around them, and yet they are the perfect picture of calm, contentment, and joy. To me, that is the essence of what it means to be a saint. Simple, quiet, unassuming people who transcend the circumstances of life to live their faith in magnificent ways every day saints. That's who we're going to talk about today. This November 1st, All Saints Day, we're going to celebrate unheralded everyday saints as we wrap up our sermon series on the saints. Let's ask, what is it? What is it that allows people to live like that? What is their secret? And how can we be more like them? Let's start with a prayer. Dear God, thank you for the beautiful souls that you have put in our lives to inspire us and to cause us to realize that it's possible for us ordinary people to also live extraordinarily beautiful lives. Show us how for our own sake, for the sake of those around us, for the sake of our hurting world that desperately needs more saints. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You, of course, are uh, familiar with the story of the three wise men who, though they got a little bit lost on the way, ultimately made it to the stable of baby Jesus where they presented him with gold, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Not exactly the most practical gifts for a newborn baby, but nonetheless, a a beautiful sentiment, right? Imagine, though, 
What would have happened if instead of three wise men, three wise women had shown up? They would have asked for directions, arrived on, on time, helped deliver the baby, cleaned the stable, baked a casserole, and brought practical gifts for the baby. Better yet, imagine if instead of three wise men, it was three wise gay men who showed up on that fateful day. Of course, they would have been fashionably late, but they would have arrived just in time to outfit baby Jesus in a beautiful buttercream colored 100% cotton throw. Then redecorate the stable in a western theme to match the animals. They would have cooked a beautiful Chilean sea bass drizzled in mango and chutney sauce and their gifts would have been from the Martha Stewart Living Collection. <laughs> My point being, some of us are like those three wise women or three wise gay men, meaning we are doers. We are the kind of people who get things done. We measure our value by what we do. And so it's natural for us to tend to think that saints are people who do Great and amazing things. If you want to be a saint, you've got to do something amazing and true. The saints that we've talked about so far in this series, St. Francis, Joan of Arc, Troy Perry, are each individuals who God used to do things that changed the course of history. So it would be easy for us to get the impression that being a great Christian is all about production. But the Bible tells us that God does not measure greatness as we do. Jesus said, in the kingdom of heaven, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. That means some of the people that we would think would be the greatest people in heaven will be not so great. And people that we think were nothings will be great in the kingdom of heaven because as the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord does not see as mortals see. They, mortals, look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart to God who you are is far more important than what you do. Being versus doing. Who you are is far more important to God than what you do. Yes, some great saints became saints because they did extraordinary acts of service. Great things. But other people are saints simply because of who they are. I've known people like that. My mom, now deceased. My grandma Minor, my grandpa Dampier, the pastor of my church when I was a teenager. You probably have your own list of great saints who've influenced in your, your life in amazing ways. What's their secret? How do they do it? How can we become more like them? In my observation, it all goes back to a single word. Every one of the everyday saints I've had the privilege to know have all shared a common characteristic that can be captured in a single word. Surrender. Surrender. Saints are people who understand that it's not all about them. That life is bigger than that. So instead of putting themselves in on center stage and pretending as if everything is supposed to revolve around them and then getting all upset when it doesn't, saints are the kind of people who simply accept whatever roles life assigns to them. Instead of fighting life, 
They embrace whatever is. I saw that in my mom. When I was a kid and she had a health scare and took a test to see if she was going to have a devastating disease, thankfully it came back okay. But in the aftermath, I overheard a conversation between her and the neighbor lady where the neighbor lady said, Katie, you must have been so afraid. And I overheard my mom saying, no, I really wasn't. I figured it was in God's hands. What will be will be. If it's my time, it's my time. I saw it in my grandma minor when she was dying of cancer, and I told her how sorry I was about that. And she said, oh, honey, it's okay. We all get to do this once. Whereas most people burn up enormous energy asking, why me? Saints instead say, why not me? Whereas most people burn up enormous energy saying, I don't understand. Saints instead say, I don't have to understand. Instead, they resolve to take life as it is, receive what is, and make the most of it. You can fight life and be miserable. Or you can embrace it and make the most of it. Like many of you right now, in this, this year, it feels like it's been this endless string of unexpected disappointments. In my personal life and here at church, it started in January with Pastor Vivian's diagnosis of cancer. Why? This, this doesn't make sense. Then there was the corona, or is, the coronavirus pandemic that, that set in, and for eight whole months, we couldn't even gather here in the sanctuary together, and, and now still it keeps us far apart and it po imposes extraordinary conditions on us. And I found myself and find myself thinking, God, how will we hold together through all of this and, and, and this beautiful church family that your spirit has built what will be left of us when we come out the other side? God, why is this happening? Why does this have to be? Then came Spencer's heart bypass emergency. Then came Spencer's resignation. Then came during this, this live streaming uh, time of worship together, these random disruptions of our live stream and, and all of the questions that come around that and all of the struggles to try to make that work. And it stresses me out because to me, technology is like magic. Thank God for people who are technological. But it stresses me out. And then a couple of weeks ago, as if we didn't have enough that we were dealing with, we discovered that some people had hacked in to our bank's credit card provider and got access to all of our church credit cards and maxed them out. Now, we shouldn't owe any money on it because it wasn't our fault but nevertheless all of a sudden all of our cards were canceled we had no way to make these payments or we had to find ways to make these payments that are part of the ongoing stream of automatic payments we had to scramble to make sure nothing got left unpaid and therefore got disconnected and and had to get, get our new cards and get everything back on there. I mean it's like God why is this happening and then this week David calls me and says Somebody has hacked into one of our personal credit cards and went on a Walmart shopping spree Meanwhile, David's side effects from his anti-seizure medicine lately have been worse than normal, and I worry about his quality of life. He was planning to be here this morning, but unable to be because of the side effects of that. 101, folks, I, I believe he will be leading your class later this afternoon. And we got a call this week from David's dad telling us that he's got a brain tumor between his eye and his ear. He'd had surgery earlier this year and we thought that had resolved it and now there's a brain tumor that's back then Wednesday night we fired up the furnaces for the church sanctuary for the first time this season and not one of four furnaces would kick on how do four furnaces all go bad at once God you think this is funny Actually, I guess God does have a sense of humor because when the repairman came out, he discovered that birds had built nests in all four 
exhaust flues of the furnaces. Once the bird nests were removed, everything was fine. But it's like, God, this is not funny enough already. If I thought that life was supposed to revolve around me and be about what I want, something's not working right. I saw a meme the other day that said, the lifestyle you ordered is out of stock. (laughs) And many of you, I know your stories, could go through a similar litany of woes, some things far more devastating than that. If you thought that life is supposed to revolve around you, you're going to be in for some bitter disappointments. The lifestyle you ordered is out of stock. So, what are we supposed to do with that? The best advice I can offer is what I saw in my mom and my grandma. Surrender. Give it up. Let it go. The lives of the saints Teach us that. Let it go. If you want to live the good life, surrender your expectations or at least hold them loosely. It's what Jesus meant when he said, Luke 17, 33, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you let your life go, You will save it. This is the number one secret of the saints. You can fight life and be miserable. Or you can embrace what is and make the most of it. You can get all freaked out about technological problems in worship today. And it'll make you miserable. Or you can say, whatever is, is. And we're going to make the most of it. I saw something the other day that really grabbed my attention. Uh, Paul Miller uh, invites us to imagine, to reimagine Psalm 23. You're no doubt familiar with Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Paul Miller invites us to reimagine what Psalm 23 would look like if the shepherd is removed from it. This is what he came up with. Verse 1, my, I shall be in want. Verse 2, me, me. Verse 3, my soul, me. Verse 4, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear, me, me. Verse 5, me, in the presence of my enemies. My head, my cup. Verse 6, me, all the days of my life. I will dwell. It's not a pretty picture. A me-centered life is a prescription for, for constant anxiety and disappointment. Paul Miller puts it this way. Without the shepherd, we are left obsessing over our wants in once in the valley of the shadow of death, paralyzed by fear in the presence of our enemies. No wonder so many are cynical. Both the child and the cynic walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but the cynic focuses on the darkness while the child focuses on the shepherd. Which brings us to the second great lesson that we can learn from everyday saints. It goes to the kind of relationship we have with God. How is it possible for some people to face all kinds of adversity and nevertheless be content, calm, and joyful? How is it possible for some people to surrender their expectations and still live good and beautiful lives? It all goes back to the kind of relationship 
we have with God. Now, I'm not talking about people who have a relationship with God versus those who don't. We're talking now about people who have a relationship with God, but different kinds of relationships. Unlike most saints, most people have what I would call a transactional relationship with God. Picture it this way. A a mom is walking down the hallway one day in her house when she overhears her young daughter praying. Dear Jesus, her little girl prays, if you will give me a bike, I'll be good for a whole week. Mom says, honey, it's no use praying that way. You can't bargain with God. Nevertheless, a few days later, walking down the hall, mom overhears her daughter praying again. Dear Jesus, she says, I'm upping my offer. If you will give me a bike, I'll be good for a whole month. Erica, her mom says, I told you, you can't bargain with God. Jesus doesn't answer prayers like that. Erica thinks about this and decides she needs to take a different approach. So she goes downstairs to the living room, to the table in the corner, where in an honored place sat the family's statue of the Virgin Mary. She picked it up reverently, carried it up to her room, put it in her closet, closed the door, got on her knees by her bed and said, Dear Jesus, if you ever want to see your mother again... (laughs) That is what you call a transactional relationship with God. I'll do for you, and you'll do for me, God. Capiche? God, I will drink less and come to church more often, and in return, you'll give me the perfect spouse or my ideal job deal. Of course, none of us would ever be overtly that crass about our relationship with God, but subconsciously, that's how Many people approach their relationship with God. Bruce Goch calls it loving God for his trust fund. Get it? A transactional relationship with God. Today's scripture passage calls us to approach our relationship with God in a very different way. You heard Duty read it a little bit earlier, that very short chapter of Scripture, one of the shortest in the Bible, yet every word is critically important. Psalm 131, verse 1. Lord, my heart is not proud, nor have I set my eyes on things beyond me. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. That is the heart of someone who understands it's not all about me. Life is bigger than that. That's the heart of someone who understands that there are an infinite number of things that are infinitely beyond me. This is not the heart of a person who's in a transactional relation with God. This is the heart of a humble child, which is exactly what the next verse points us to. Verse 2. I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. My soul within me is like a weaned child. In this way of relating to God, I am a little child. And God is my mommy holding me on her lap. Now, don't be put off or surprised by the female imagery there. Genesis 1 and 2 teaches us that both male and female are created in the image of God and we need imagery from both male and female experiences to fully appreciate the greatness of God. And so this happens to be a passage of the scripture that uses female imagery to help us to more fully understand the greatness of God. And in this way of relating to God, I am a little child. And God is my mommy holding me on her lap. And I am perfectly calm, contented, joyful, and trusting. Because I know how powerful my mommy is 
and how much she loves me. Elizabeth uh, Debisi tells a story about one night when she was putting her daughter Carla to bed. As she was putting her to bed, she said, uh, she said, so Carla, how does it feel to be four years old? Carla said, it feels special. Mom said, special how? Carla said, because I know my mommy loves me. When you know that you are loved, when you know that God loves you like the best mother in the world, it's not hard to let go of your expectations and trust. It becomes innate. It becomes natural when we relate to God in that kind of way. Jesus calls us to that kind of relationship with God, except Jesus uses a different word to help us picture and imagine. The word that Jesus uses is Abba. In Jesus' culture, Abba was the the Aramaic term of endearment, an intimate term of endearment that children of all ages used to refer to a beloved father. The closest English equivalent of a translation of Abba would be Daddy or Papa. Papa God. That's the kind of relationship Jesus invites us to embrace as we pray to God, as we picture our relationship with God. It's one of a little child, completely contented and trusting in the presence of a powerful, loving parent. When you see life that way, you can excel, you can trust. Dave Stone tells about a time that uh, he took his family to one of these big outdoor uh, uh, swimming pools in the park and, and he was down in the deep end near the diving board when his, when his uh, four-year-old daughter Savannah, all outfitted in her floaties, started to walk down the steps into the shallow end of the pool, the three-foot end of the pool. As soon as she submerged herself in the water, a look of panic came over her face, and and she called out and said, Daddy, I'm scared. I want to be with you. He called back to her and said, Savannah, the water is really deep down here. She said, I don't care. I want to be with you. Okay, he said, so paddle on down here. So she starts paddling down in three feet of water, which is quickly then four feet of water. By the mid part of the pool, it's six feet of water. She's starting to realize how deep, deep is. There's that panicked look again on her face, but she continues bravely through eight feet of water down to 12 feet of water. Dave says, when she got to me, she threw her arms around my neck. And I put my arms around her and immediately the panic was gone. And she was filled with delight. Perfectly contented, perfectly joyful in the deepest waters. Every saint I've ever had the privilege to know has had that kind of relationship with God. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery. In oceans deep, my faith will stand. And I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours and you are mine. When you know that your Abba is with you every step of the way, and that your Abba loves you with a love immeasurable. It's not hard to let go. 
It's not hard to be at peace. And that in turn allows you to begin to see life in the way Jesus calls us to see life. Which brings us to our last point. The third great characteristic we see common in the lives of everyday saints. Matthew chapter 20 verse 26. Jesus said, The Son of Man has come not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. He goes on to say to his disciples, if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, you need to be like that, a servant. It's a very common idea that discipleship means asking, what would Jesus do. This past week, uh, I was walking out of Walmart after I did my grocery shopping, about to get in my car. I noticed somebody had dropped, left a $20 bill on the pavement. Being the saint that I am, the first thing I thought was, what would Jesus do? So I turned it into wine. (laughs) Okay, so that didn't really happen. But As disciples of Jesus, we are supposed to constantly be asking, what would Jesus do? Jesus calls us to embrace servanthood. When you surrender, number one, when you surrender your expectations, and number two, embrace a relationship with God That is, a child being loved by the best parent. It's not hard then, number three, to embrace the servant's way of life. To let go of your expectations and see your life the way Jesus called you to see it. As a servant of the living God. Now... Don't misunderstand, when we think of saints and service and and sacrificial love, our natural tendency is to think of dramatic acts of sacrifice like Joan of Arc going into battle or Troy Perry standing in a burned out, bombed out church. We tend to think of loving sacrifice in the saintly vein as being martyrdom and and facing dramatic danger. Pastor Fred Craddock invites us to see it differently. He says, think of it like this. Think of a person who takes a $1,000 bill and plops it down on a, uh, a table and says, God, I give all of this to you. That's dramatic. That's flashy. Major sacrifice, right? But now, Fred says, think of it differently. Suppose you take that $1,000 to the bank and you exchange it for oodles of quarters. And then for the next 50 years, one by one, you give those quarters away. 25 cents here, 50 cents here. Listening to a neighbor kid who's having trouble in his life. Going to a nursing home and serving a cup of cold water to an old man with shaky hands. Playing a game with your children when you're so tired you'd rather rest. 25 cents at a time, 50 cents at a time. We give our life away in service. Beautiful acts of loving sacrifice. I saw that in my mom. I saw that in my grandma. You see it in everyday saints all the time. As life flows and opportunities for service arise in the normal routine of the day, everyday saints are quick to embrace those opportunities. What does it mean to live as an everyday saint? One, you surrender your expectations to God because you know that God's loving presence will be with you wherever life takes you, which then frees you to live with a servant's heart of sacrificial love. Let me close with this. A little boy in second grade, Jeremy, was sitting at his desk praying for the break, the next break to come quickly as he was trying to hold it in and get to the restroom during the break. But 
It didn't come soon enough. He lost control. He peed his pants. A puddle formed beneath him at his desk and he knew it was just a matter of time before somebody noticed and his reputation would be toast and everybody would be making fun of him for the rest of the school year. About that time, the teacher was walking across the classroom toward him. He was about to be discovered. But his fate would have it at that same moment One of his classmates, Susie, was walking down the aisle carrying the class's goldfish bowl. She tripped and ended up dumping the entire contents right in Jeremy's lap. He pretended to be really upset but secretly was saying, Thank you, Jesus, because now nobody will know I'll be the object of affection and Susie will be the object of derision. Sure enough, the teacher sympathetically says, Oh, Jeremy... I'm so sorry this is happening. Go down to the locker room and put on some dry gym shorts and hang your pants out to dry. And and by the time Jeremy gets back to the room, sure enough, everybody is teasing and making fun of Susie. You're such a klutz. I can't believe you did that. Stay away from me through the end of the school day. Until that afternoon, all the kids were released and lining up in their lines to get on their buses. As Jeremy was walking out to school, he saw Susie standing there in one of the bus lines, he walks up to her, whispers in her ear and says, you did that on purpose, didn't you? She whispered back, I once peed my pants too. That's what it looks like to live as an everyday saint. It's not all about me. It's much bigger than that. I am here to serve in whatever ways, large or small, life serves up. And every step of the way, I know I'm not alone. Because my Abba is with me, loving me, and giving me a song. Even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I can be sitting in a bomb crater on a charred chair and make beautiful music. Jesus calls us to embrace that way of being. Will you? If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you let it go, you will save it.